of different kings who were actually demons but were posing themselves as the royal order. At that time, the whole world became perturbed and the predominating deity of this earth, known as Bhumi, went to see Lord Brahma to tell her uh, to tell of her calamities due to the demoniac kings. Bhumi assured, uh, I'm sorry, Bhumi assumed the shape of a cow and presented herself before Lord Brahma with tears in her eyes. She was bereaved and was weeping just to invoke the Lord's compassion. She related the calamitous position of the earth and after hearing this, Lord Brahma became much aggrieved and he at once started for the ocean of milk where Lord Vishnu resides. Lord Brahma was accompanied by all the demigods headed by Lord Shiva, and Bhumi also followed. Arriving on the shore of the milk ocean, Lord Brahma began to pacify Lord Vishnu, who had formerly saved the earthly planet by assuming the transcendental form of a boar. In the Vedic mantras, there is a particular type of prayer called Purusha Sukta. Generally, the demigods offer their obeisances unto Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by chanting the Purusha Sukta. It is understood herein that the predominating deity of every planet can see the Supreme Lord of this universe, Brahma, whenever there is some disturbance on his planet. On, the, on his planet. And Brahma can approach the Supreme Lord Vishnu, not by seeing him directly, but by standing on the shore of the ocean of milk. There is a planet within the universe called Sweta Dvipa, and on that planet there is an ocean of milk. It is understood from various Vedic literatures that just as there is an ocean of salt water on this planet, there are various kinds of oceans on other planets. Somewhere there is an ocean of milk, somewhere there is an ocean of oil, and somewhere there is an ocean of liquor and of many other types of liquids. The Purusha Sukta is the standard prayer which the demigods recite to appease the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Shirodakshai Vishnu. Because he is lying on the ocean of milk, he is called Shirodakshai Vishnu. He is the form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead through whom all the incarnations within this universe appear. After the demigods offered the Purusha Sukta prayer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they apparently heard no response. Then Lord Brahma personally sat in meditation and there was a message transmission from Lord Vishnu to Brahma. Brahma then broadcast a message to the demigods. That is the system of receiving, receiving Vedic knowledge. The Vedic knowledge is received first by Brahma from the Supreme Personality of Godhead through the medium of the heart. As stated in the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, Tene Brahma Hridaya Adikavai. The transcendental knowledge of the Vedas was transmitted to Lord Brahma through the heart. Here also, in the same way, only Brahma could understand the message transmitted by Lord Vishnu and he broadcast it to the demigods for their immediate action. The message was this. The Supreme Personality of Godhead would appear on the earth very soon along with his supreme powerful potencies. And as long as he remained on the earth planet to execute his mission of annihilating the demons and establishing the devotees, his mission of uh, the demigods should also remain there to assist him. They should all immediately take birth in the family of the Yadu dynasty, wherein the Lord would also appear in due course of time. The Supreme Personality Godhead himself, Krishna, would personally appear as the son of Vasudeva before his appearance. Before his appearance, all the demigods, along with their wives, should appear in different pious families in the world just to assist the Lord in executing his mission. The exact word used here is tat priyartam, which means the demigods should appear on the earth in order to please the Lord. In other words, any living entity who lives only to satisfy the Lord is a demigod. The demigods were further informed that Ananta, the plenary portion of Lord Krishna, who is maintaining the universal planets by extending his millions of hoods, would also appear on earth before Lord Krishna's appearance. They were also informed that the external potency of Vishnu, Maya, with whom all the conditioned souls are enamored, would also appear by the order of the Supreme Lord just to execute his purpose. After instructing and pacifying all the demigods, as well as Bhumi, 
with sweet words, Lord Brahma, the father of all prajapatis, uh, prajapatis, or progenitors of the universal population, departed for his own abode, the highest material planet called Brahmaloka. The leader of the Yadu dynasty, King Surasena, was ruling over the country known as Mathura, wherein lies the city of Mathura, as well as the district known as Surasena, which was named after him. On account of the rule of King Surasena, Mathura became the capital city of all the kings of the Yadus. Mathura was also made the capital of the kings of the Yadu dynasty because the Yadus were a very pious family and knew that Mathura is the place where Lord Sri Krishna lives eternally, just as he also lives in Dwarka. Once upon a time, Vasudeva, the son of Surasena, just after marrying Devaki, was going home on his chariot with his newly wedded wife, the father of Devaki, known as Devaka, had contributed a sufficient dowry because he was very affectionate toward his daughter. He had contributed hundreds of chariots completely decorated with gold equipment. At that time, Kamsa, the son of Ugrasena, in order to please his sister, Devaki, had voluntarily taken the reins of the horses of Vasudeva's chariot and was driving. According to the custom of the Vedic civilization, when a girl is married, the brother takes the sister and brother-in-law to their home because the newly married girl may feel too much separation from her father's family. The brother goes with her until she reaches her father's father-in-law's home. The full dowry contributed by Devaka was as follows. 400 elephants fully decorated with golden garlands. 15,000 decorated horses and 1,800 chariots. He also arranged for 200 beautiful girls to follow his daughter. The Chatriya system of marriage, still current in India, dictates that when a Chatriya is married, a few dozen of the bride's young girlfriends, in addition to the bride, go to the house of the king. The followers of the queen are also maidservants, but actually they act as friends of the queen. This practice is prevalent from time immemorial, traceable at least to the time before the advent of Lord Krishna 5,000 years ago. She, so Vyasadeva brought home another 200 beautiful girls along with his wife Devaki. While the bride and bridegroom were passing along on the chariot, there were different kinds of musical instruments playing to indicate the auspicious moment. There were conch shells, bugles, drums, and kettle drums. Combined together, they were vibrating a nice concert. The procession was passing very ple pleasingly, and Kamsa was driving the chariot when suddenly there was a miraculous sound vibrated from the sky, which especially announced to Kamsa, Kamsa, you are such a fool. You are driving the chariot of your sister and your brother-in-law, but you do not know that the eighth child of this sister will kill you. Kamsa was the son of Ugrasena of the Boja dynasty. It is said that Kamsa was the most demonic of all the Boja dynasty kings. Immediately after hearing the prophecy from the sky, he caught hold of Devaki's hair and was just about to kill her with his sword. Vasudeva was astonished at Kamsa's behavior, and in order to pacify the cruel, shameless brother-in-law, he began to speak as follows with great reason and evidence. He said, My dear brother-in-law, Kamsa, you are the most famous king of the Boja dynasty, and people know that you are the greatest warrior and a valiant king. How is it that you are so infuriated that you are prepared to kill a woman who is your own sister at this auspicious time of her marriage? Why should you be so much afraid of death? Death is already born along with your birth. From the very day you took your birth, you begin to die. Suppose you are 25 years old, that means you have already died 25 years. Every moment, every second you are dying. Why then should you be so much afraid of death? Final death is inevitable. You may die either today or in a hundred years. You cannot avoid death. Why should you be so much afraid? Actually, death means annihilation of the present body. As soon as the present body stops functioning and mixes with the five elements of material nature, the living entity within the body accepts another body. 
according to his present actions and reactions. It is just like when a man walks on the street, he puts forward his foot, and when he is confident that his foot is situated on sound ground, he lifts the other foot in this way, one after another, the bodies change and the soul transmigrates. See how the plant worms change from one twig to another so carefully. Similarly, the living entity changes his body as soon as the higher authorities decide on his next body. As long as the living entity is conditioned within this material world, he must, make t he must take material bodies one after another. His next particular body is offered by the laws of nature according to the actions and reactions of this life. This body is exactly like one of the bodies which we always see in dreams. During our dream of sleep, we create so many bodies according to mental creation. We have seen gold, and we have, seen, and we have also seen a mountain. So in a dream, we can see a golden mountain by combining the two ideas. Sometimes in dreams, we see that we have a body which is flying in the sky, and at that time, we completely forget our present body. Similarly, these bodies are changing. When you have one body, you forget the past body. During a dream, we may make contact with so many new kinds of bodies, but when we are awake, we forget them all. And actually, these material bodies are the creations of our mental activities. But at the present moment, we do not recollect our past bodies. The nature of the mind is flickering. Sometimes it accepts something, and immediately it rejects the same thing. Accepting and rejecting is the process of the mind in contact with the five objects of sense gratification, form, taste, smell, sound, and touch. In a, specula in a speculative way, the mind comes in touch with the objects of sense gratification, and when the living entity desires a particular type of body, he gets it. Therefore, the body is an offering by the laws of material nature. The living entity accepts the body and comes out again into the material world to enjoy or suffer according to the construction of the body. Unless we have a particular type of body, we cannot enjoy or suffer according to our mental proclivities inherited from the previous life. The particular type of body is actually offered to us according to our mental condition at the time of death. The luminous planets like the sun, moon, or stars reflect themselves in different types of reservoirs like water, oil, or ghee. The reflection moves according to the movement of the reservoir. The reflection of the moon is on the water, and the moving water makes the moon also appear to be moving, but actually the moon, moon is not moving. Similarly, by mental concoction, the living entity attains different kinds of bodies, although actually he has no connection with such bodies. But on account of illusion, being enchanted by the influence of maya, the living entity thinks that he belongs to a particular type of body that is the way of conditioned life. Suppose a living entity is now in a human form of body. He thinks that he belongs to the human community or a particular country or a particular place. He identifies himself in that way and unnecessarily prepares for another body, which is not required by him. Such desires and mental concoctions are the cause of different types of bodies. The covering influence of material nature is so strong that the living entity is satisfied in whatever body he gets, and he identifies with that body with great pleasure. Therefore, I beg to request you not to be overwhelmed by the dictation of your mind and body. Vasudeva thus requested Kamsa not to be envious of his newly married sister. One should not be envious of anyone, because envy is the cause of fear both in this world and in the next, when one is before Yamaraja, the lord of punishment after death. Vasudeva appealed to Kamsa on behalf of Devaki, stating that she was his younger sister. He also appealed at an auspicious moment and at the time of marriage. A younger sister or brother is supposed to be protected by one's child. Uh, uh, supposed to be protected as one's child. The position is overall so delicate, Vasudeva reasoned, that if you kill her, it will go against your high reputation. In this way, Vasudeva tried to pacify Kamsa by good instruction as well as by philosophical discrimination. But Kamsa was not to be pacified because his association was demoniac. 
Because of his demoniac association, he was a demon, although born in a very high royal family. A demon never cares for any good instruction. He is just like a determined thief. One can give him moral instruction, but it will not be effective. Similarly, those who are demoniac or atheistic by nature can hardly assimilate any good instruction, however authorized it may be. That is the difference between demigods and demons. Those who can accept good instruction and try to live their lives in that way are called demigods, and those who are unable to take such good instruction are called demons. Failing in his attempt to pacify Kamsa, Vasudeva wondered how he would protect his wife Devaki. When there is imminent danger, an intelligent person should try to avoid the dangerous position as far as possible. But if, in spite of endeavoring, all, endeavoring by all intelligence, one fails to avoid the dangerous position, there is no fault on his part. One should try his best to execute his duties, but if the attempt fails, he is not at fault. Vasudeva well, thought of his wife as follows. For the present, let me save the life of Devaki. Then later on, if there are children, I shall see how to save them. He further thought, if in the future I get a child who can kill Kamsa, just as Kamsa is thinking, then both Devaki and the child will be saved because the law of providence is inconceivable. But now, some way or other, let me save the life of Devaki. There is no certainty how a living entity contacts a certain type of body, just as there is no certainty how a blazing fire comes in contact with a certain type of wood in the forest. When there is a forest fire, it is experienced that the blazing fire sometimes leaps over one tree and catches another by the influence of the wind. Similarly, a living entity may be very careful in the manner matter of executing his duties, but it is still very difficult for him to know what type of body he is going to get in the next life. Maharaja Bharata was very faithfully executing the deities of self-realization, but by chance he developed temporary, temporary affection for a deer and his next life, and in his next life he had to accept the body of a deer. Vasudeva, after deliberating on how to save his wife, began to speak to Kamsa with great respect, although Kamsa was the most sinful man. Sometimes it happens that a most virtuous, virtuous person like Vasudeva has to flatter a person like Kamsa, a most vicious person. That is the way of all diplomatic transactions. Although Vasudeva was deeply aggrieved, he smiled outwardly. He addressed the shameless Kamsa in that way because he was so atrocious. Vasudeva said to Kamsa, My dear brother-in-law, Please consider that you have no danger from your sister. You are awaiting some danger because you have heard a prophetic voice in the sky. But the danger is to come from the sons of your sister, who are not present now. And who knows? There may or may not be sons in the future. Considering all this, you are safe for the present, nor is there cause of fear from your sister. If there are any sons born of her, I promise that I shall present all of them to you for necessary action. Kamsa knew the value of Vasudeva's word of honor, and he was convinced by his argument. For the time being, he desisted from the heinous killing of his sister. Thus Vasudeva was pleased and praised the decision of Kamsa. In this way, he returned to his home. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So there's so many wonderful points made by Srila Prabhupada. But one that is very important, uh, several of them which are very important, is that one should not be envious of anyone because envy is the cause of fear, both in this world and in the next. When one is before Yamaraj, the Lord of Punishment after death, so enviousness is a very powerful negative feeling where you actually not only want to emulate a person, but actually you want to destroy them before you are happy. So it's very dangerous and, it cause, and it's the cause of fear. Why should envy be the cause of fear? 
and it says, both in this world and in the next, when one is before Yamaraj, the Lord of Punishment after death. Well, when you envy someone, you want to destroy them, and you make different plans, but you're not sure that you're going to succeed. And if you don't succeed, there's going to be dire consequences. And it gets you involved in so many uh, unclean thoughts and behavior and plans and, and actions. So I, I was recently talking to someone and they were uh, trying to get a divorce and but it's very complicated sometimes to get a divorce. And uh, and this person said, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that to try and hurt this person. I said, that would be the biggest mistake you ever make. Oh, well, they hurt me. Well, that's okay. But by continuing in that uh, tit for tat or uh, uh, responding uh, with uh, uh, violence to violence, you only proliferate more violence. You're not going to solve any problem. I said you should not do it. So it's very hard for people who are angry and envious of someone to stop uh, different types of antagonistic behavior because they're so hell-bent on getting revenge. But that only gets makes one's life more complicated, more miserable, and full of more danger by acting in that way. So that's one important point. And another important point is Vasudeva tried to co pacify Kamsa by good instruction as well as by philosophical dis discrimination. But Kamsa was not to be pacified because his association with, uh, was not to be pacified because his association was demoniac. Now this is very important because there's a difference between uh, having business or professional relationship with demons and associating with demons. So when you associate with demons, you actually partake of their behavior. It doesn't mean you, you might do what they do, but you watch what they do. You hear about what they do. And if they can get away with what they do, you begin to think, well, maybe there's some, uh, uh, let's say, value in uh, being like them because they look like they're being successful, you see. So, therefore, the demons are able to, in, to uh, influence even good people by their uh, temporary successes and temporary material opulence and temporary sense gratification that they brag about. And then all of a sudden, one can get bewildered and say, well, maybe I should be like that. So uh, what's being said here is that Kamsa was not pacified by good instruction as well as by philosophical discrimination. But Kamsa was not to be, uh, in other words, Kamsa was not to be pacified because of his association was demoniac. Because of his demoniac association, he was a demon, although born in a very high royal family. A demon never cares for any good instruction. So now, that is the definition of a demon. It's not they don't necessarily drink, smoke, and do this and do that. Even a seemingly good person can be a demon if they refuse to accept good instruction. So you should, you should keep this in mind because sometimes in our own lives uh, we need to have good instruction. But if we refuse to take it, that is a demoniac mentality. So we should be very careful to be always attentive whenever good instruction is given by honest devotees for one's welfare. <coughs> A demon never cares for any good instruction. He is just like a determined thief. One can give him moral instruction, but it will not be effective. Similarly, those who are demoniac or atheistic by nature can hardly assimilate any good instruction 
however authorized it may be. That is the difference between demigods and demons. See, now demigods, they act like demons sometimes, but when they are chastised uh, and when they, just like Arjuna, Arjuna is a good person, but he refused to follow Krishna's instruction in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna chastised him and then uh, called him a fool, basically a fool, for uh, being for lamenting for something that's not worth lamenting for. So, therefore, uh, even a good person can become demoniac by not being able to assimilate or accept good instruction. And that's because of bad association. <clears throat> Those who can accept good instruction and try to live their lives in that way are called demigods. And those who are unable to take such good instruction are called demons. Okay, so we'll stop right there. There's so many important instructions here. And uh, we would like to have other people read uh, the uh, Krishna book today, at least to the end of, uh, at least to... Uh, the point where Krishna appears and chastises, I mean, uh, appears and is taken to uh, uh, Vrindavan in exchange for uh, 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 Subhadra, uh, and then uh, Kamsa comes back to the, uh, the jail, and then, I mean, uh, Vasudeva brings a, a female child back to the jail, and then Kamsa comes down the kill the expecting the little boy but then it's a girl and he still tries to kill her and then uh, Durga Devi manifests before him so we should read in, at least till that point to the appearance of the Lord so anybody will want to read from uh, uh, after Guru Puja and probably take till around 11 or 12 this morning Hare Krishna you can come and volunteer I'll be here also are there any questions question uh, don't worry about time you have all day today well that's explained they did penance for 12,000 years in their previous birth in order to have Krishna as their son. And they did it together, husband and wife. It's so not easy to get Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the prize is so great, the uh, endeavor is also very taxing. But they were determined. 12,000 years they meditated together to have Krishna as their son. Well, your hope, your hope, my hope, and everybody else's hope is Lord Chaitanya's mercy. By Lord Chaitanya's mercy, even the impossible becomes possible. Therefore, Prabhupada says, if you want to use reason and logic, use it to try and understand Lord Chaitanya's mercy because it is unfathomable how merciful he is. He's giving the chance to the lowest people to, to attain the highest goal and rather easily, simply by chanting and dancing. Because Prabhupada says, dancing is also scientific. This dancing for Krishna is also scientific. And uh, so the chanting, dancing, feasting, and hearing uh, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, doing Sankirtan, all this is uh, Anandamaya Bhyasat full of transcendental nectar. So the impossible has become very possible by the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and his Sankirtan party. We should meditate on that. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Gauris, the Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.
Can you meditate for 12,000 years? <laughs> well, but can, can um, you go on Sankirtan? I'm 